Throughout the history of the Disney parks, Disney has often chosen to replace existing attractions with new attractions, or re-theme them. For some reason at Walt Disney World, they also do this, even though, allegedly, they have the blessing of size. And now I'm getting too snarky. But just because a land or attraction is gone or re-themed does not mean that it is forgotten. Sometimes there are little references hidden here or there meant to remind people about what came before. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Sometimes there is also infrastructure just sitting there going completely unused as the years go by and the memories of what once was fade into obscurity. But not anymore, my friends. Not today because I refuse to let these ideas, these rides, these references die. I refuse to let them go quietly into that good night because today we are going through five different references, homages, and even remnants of Disney's forgotten history. Because I have nothing better to do with my time than to scour the depths of the internet for information about these lost remnants, and if I have to look these things up and hear about them, then you do too. This isn't necessarily a top five list, there's no particular order to this, this is just five different remnants or references to lost Disney history. So, without any further ado, let's begin with number five. Number five <clears throat> on this list takes us to the Indiana Jones Adventure at Disneyland. You see, no attraction really predated the Indiana Jones Adventure. It didn't replace any attraction. It replaced a parking lot. And you can actually find the parking lot sign up by the projector in the mm, bumpy room. But that's not what we're talking about here in this entry. No, instead, we are going to be talking about a former sponsorship that still lingers in dark corners of the queue. You see, when the Indiana Jones Adventure opened in 1995, it was sponsored. Which I guess would explain why the attraction is so high and was so high in quality. It's because Disney didn't have to pay for it. AT&T were actually the ones who sponsored the construction and first seven years of operation. So that's 1995 to uh, two, carry to three, uh, uh, 2002. See, AT&T, they were all about connectivity and communication, which is why they also sponsored Spaceship Earth over at Epcot at the time, at least. It's also why, on the walls of the queue, you may be able to find some old, ancient inscriptions in an unknown language. Now, at the time of the AT&T sponsorship, cast members would actually hand out decoder cards for these messages, allowing you to translate the words on the wall to, I guess, American English. You see, it's all about communication, which is cool. That's a nice little remnant of the AT&T sponsorship. But the one part of the sponsorship that still remains and always sort of stands out to me like a sore thumb. The number five entry on the list is this sign right here. This dang sign. What is the point of this dang sign? It always just sort of surprises me on my way out of the Temple of the Forbidden Eye back out into Adventureland. I'm like, why? I mean... I guess. What do you mean by wisely? What are you talking about? Apparently, it's a leftover from the AT&T sponsorship, although with a little bit different wording. Back in the early days of the attraction, the sign actually read, True rewards await those who choose wisely. So, if you're ever walking out of the Indiana Jones adventure and you see that sign hanging above you and you're wondering what purpose it serves, it seems kind of out of left field. Turns out you're just looking at a decorporatized advertisement on your way out. I mean, choose wisely, maybe that's you choosing to upgrade to a park hopper now. Certainly not choosing AT&T because they don't sponsor the ride, not because they're terrible. I, I wouldn't, I have no idea. Eh, let's just move on to number four. What do you say, Mike? <laughs> not a zoo. Disney's Animal Kingdom, it's many, many things, but remember it's not a zoo! So, <clears throat> what I just showed you, what you just watched, is the Not a Zoo commercial from the opening of Disney's Animal Kingdom back in 1998. And the purpose of the commercial was to show you that Animal Kingdom was not a zoo. And you put that together, Not a Zoo, it kind of sounds like an African word. That was the pitch. Don't know if that was a fantastic pitch. I mean, I guess the point of the commercial was to drill home that Animal Kingdom was not just a Disney zoo. 
Animal Kingdom is meant to be so much more than just a zoo, but back in 1998, people didn't really have any frame of reference and obviously couldn't experience it for themselves until opening. So to get the messaging out there, Disney went ahead with the Not A Zoo campaign. And even though Animal Kingdom has changed drastically since it opened in 1998, there are still a few references and opening day attractions littered throughout the park. Number four on this list has to do with a little homage to Not A Zoo that still exists in the park today at the end of of Kilimanjaro Safaris, an opening day attraction. Upon exiting the ride, you may notice a small crate labeled ZU2298 Radio. The 22 and 98 here being a reference to the 22nd of April, the fourth month of the year, and 1998, the year Animal Kingdom opened, April 22nd, 1998. But the ZU are the last two letters of not a zoo. Now, although I think the marketing campaign was kind of, you know, I do think that other than maybe Disneyland or Epcot, Animal Kingdom has a lot of remnants of what used to be. There are abandoned Discovery River exhibits and shacks everywhere in this park, so I think seeing a purpose full, not abandoned reference to Animal Kingdom's past is always really fun. Even though the commercial it came from is 26 years old, sometimes you still have people who know walking around Animal Kingdom saying not to zoo, so I, I guess it kind of ended up working. <laughs> To say that when Disneyland opened, there were an abundance of picnic areas would be a bit of an understatement. All of Disneyland Park and the parking lot outside of it were built in about a year back in 1955, so that was an incredibly fast pace of production, although safety regulations and licensing, they weren't exactly the way that they are today, so that probably contributed to the faster rate of production back then. But because Disneyland was still very much being planned out while it was being constructed, there was a lot of unused space specifically in opening day Tomorrowland, and then just various areas around the castle and the exterior of the park. Sure, you had the railroad, you had Fantasyland, you had Tomorrowland, but you also had places like, I don't know, Holiday Hill, which eventually ended up turning into the Matterhorn bobsleds. The backside of the Plaza Pavilion that was themed toward Adventureland that allowed you to look out over the Jungle Cruise, it's where Tropical Hideaway is today. Just places to relax, eat, and, you know, watch different various forms of entertainment, like Disneyland bands and Jungle Cruise boats going by. I mean, to be completely fair, I do find it really fun to sit at the tropical hideaway and just watch Jungle Cruise boats going by, so that is a valid form of entertainment, to me, at least. Number three on this list, though, has to do with another one of these spaces that was just sort of used for whatever, some sort of celebration, eating food, relaxing in the middle of the day, the Carnation Plaza Gardens. The Carnation Plaza Gardens were a place for people to relax in the middle of the day, do some swing dancing, enjoy the big bandstand, and get some wonderful views of Sleeping Beauty Castle and Main Street USA. It was a place of celebration, a place of dancing, a place of music that was simultaneously sort of both Fantasyland and Main Street USA at the same time. Mostly swing dancing though, people were mainly there to dance, especially at nighttime. That place could probably get a little raucous back in its day, I don't know, I never, I never got to see it. However, when the year 2012 rolled around, Disney decided it was time to say goodbye to the Carnation Plaza Garden. Because you see, swing dancing wasn't quite the cat's meow as it had once been, and princess meet and greets, now that was where the entertainment was. Everybody wanted to meet a princess. In fact, the original plan for New Fantasyland out in the Magic Kingdom was like 90% princess meet and greets. So it was announced that Carnation Plaza Gardens would begin its transformation, going from an extension of Main Street USA serving as a transition into Fantasyland to an extension of Fantasyland serving as a transition into Main Street USA. It's, it's flipped, it's backwards. Now we have Fantasy Fair, and I actually quite like Fantasy Fair. Especially the Tangled and the Beauty and the Beast shows that they do there during the daytime. It's just a ton of fun. However, people still haven't forgotten about Carnation Plaza Gardens, Disney included. Actually, during Throwback Night, the Disneyland After Dark event that I got to go to, one of the entertainment offerings for the night was swing dancing at the Royal Theater in Fantasy Fair, which of course is sort of celebrating the past of the area as Carnation Plaza Gardens. But there is one permanent piece of Plaza Gardens left in Fantasy Fair, but you have to look up. If you angle your vision up toward the tallest spire in Fantasy Fair over that sort of walkway leading toward Rancho del Zocalo, and then look just below the spire, just above the window, you might see a plaque that bears the letters CPG for Carnation Plaza Gardens, a reference, an homage, a nod 
to what came before Fantasy Fair. Also, just another little neat fun fact, I don't have to throw this in here, but I am going to anyway. One of the chimneys on top of a building in Fantasy Fair is colored and angled in just a way that it hides the peak of Big Thunder Mountain right behind it. Just a little sight line attention to detail there that I think is really neat and worth referencing. But that's not number three on the list, okay? Number three on the list is the CPG plaque because that's there for a reason. That has history to it. Hidden deep within the Dino Institute, past quaint displays and dusty artifacts, in a once secret underground research facility, lies the most incredible machine ever engineered the CTX Time Rover. Dinosaur! Dinosaur. He didn't really sound super excited to be doing that commercial. That's right, number two on our list takes us back to Disney's Animal Kingdom, actually, again. Now, I like Dinosaur. It's one of my favorite attractions at Animal Kingdom, and it's actually an opening day attraction. Just a nice, fun little Indiana Jones adventure style dark ride that takes you to the late Cretaceous period where you almost get hit by the asteroid that killed all of the dinosaurs in the KT Extinction event. It's just a great time all around. Family fun for everyone. Yeah, did I also mention it's super dark? Like, you just can't see anything. The entire time. It's a wonderful attraction. Am I sad it's going to be removed to make way for another Indiana Jones adventure attraction? A little bit. Will the Indiana Jones adventure attraction be better than Dinosaur? Most likely. Dinosaur is very outdated, but even though I'm looking forward to the Indiana Jones attraction, I am still sad we're losing Dinosaur. I can have both. I can be excited and sad at the same time. Now, if there are any history buffs out there, any DAC history buffs, that's Disney's Animal Kingdom for the layman, odds are that you know when Animal Kingdom opened in 1998, the name of Dinosaur wasn't Dinosaur. Dinosaur was actually the result of a name change in the year 2000 to tie into the new Walt Disney Animation Studios movie, Dinosaur. It was very creative on Disney's part, and they also added Aladar. Aladar? Aladar, the Iguanodon from the film. The original name for the attraction, though, was Countdown to Extinction, or CTE, or CTX, depending on who you ask. Now, keep that in mind for a moment. As you make your way through the queue and the pre-show for Dinosaur, you may notice a few, you know, scientifically labeled things, especially on your rover, the, the, the ride vehicle that you board for the attraction. A bunch of different scientific words and labels and some warning stickers, and honestly, we probably shouldn't be touching any of this, but go crazy. I mean, I'm sure it's gonna be fine. But what's important to us here is the name of the actual time rover that we're boarding, and if you're wondering what the name is, we showed it at the beginning with that commercial, but it's also displayed on the back of the Jeep, I mean the, the time rover. Your vehicle isn't just a time rover, it is a CTX time rover. CTX, or Countdown to Extinction. The CTX time rover. Yep, I, I heard he said that. It's a reference to Countdown to Extinction, the original name of the attraction. On your way out of the attraction, you can also find pipes labeled with the chemical compositions of ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise. This is a reference, of course, to Countdown to Extinction being sponsored by, of all companies, McDonald's when it first opened. But I feel like that one's a little bit more of a well-known fun fact. I didn't know about the CTX Time Rover being called CTX for Countdown to Extinction until very recently. I don't know if that's sad or not. But there are other places on the Time Rover where you can find references to Countdown to Extinction. For instance, this sticker that says it's Dino Model Certified CTX 47E, designed by Walt Disney Imagineering Imaging Technologies in Glendale, California. Might I just add, the headquarters of Disney Imagineering. And then this label on the wall in the loading zone says CTX, Countdown to Extinction, WDI, Walt Disney Imagineering, AK-98, Animal Kingdom, 1998. Even as you just walk through the standby queue of Dinosaur, you can tell that it hasn't changed too much since 98 when it first opened. It's one of those vintage Animal Kingdom feeling attractions. You know how people talk about classic Epcot rides like Spaceship Earth and Living with the Land? Dinosaur is a classic Animal Kingdom ride. And just like classic Epcot attractions, Dinosaur is chock full of references to its past if you know where to look. Even if you don't know where to look, most of the ride remains unchanged. They have changed out a few effects and the name, obviously, and they put Aladar in there, and there he is. And so I highly recommend getting your behind down to Dak or Disney's Animal Kingdom for the layman and riding Dinosaur at least just one more time, get a feel for it, and then when it closes inevitably this year or early next year for the Tropical America's transformation, you'll have fond memories of Dinosaur in your head, and you'll look forward to the Indiana Jones experience that's coming after. Like I said, I can be sad and excited at the same time. 
And now back to your regularly scheduled number one entry on the list. Of course we are going back to Disneyland. You gotta go back to Disneyland for number one. It's where it all began. Historians are often at a loss as to why Walt Disney wanted to build Disneyland in the first place. Was it because he wanted to build a theme park enterprise where parents and children could have fun together? No. In fact, I think this is a common misconception. I am of a different train of belief. Walt Disney didn't want to build Disneyland in order to fulfill some sort of deep-seated dream of opening a theme park that's for everyone. He didn't build Disneyland to bring the worlds of his movies to life in order to immerse people into these settings and into these stories. No, Walt Disney built Disneyland because he wanted a train. Sure, he had the Carrollwood Pacific in his backyard, but he wanted something more true to life. And even though the Disneyland Railroad isn't exactly a one-to-one -one steam locomotive, it's still better than sitting on that tiny little thing in his backyard. I think Walt built the entirety of Disneyland because he wanted an excuse for a bigger train. I'm serious. The Disneyland Railroad is one of the most iconic attractions, not just at Disneyland, but within all of the Disney parks. It's so iconic that when they open a brand new Disneyland style park without a train, it feels like it's missing something. It feels wrong. Shanghai Disneyland does not have a railroad circling the park, which is lame because it should. The Walt Disney World Railroad doesn't let you bring your snacks on board, which is lame because it should. The Disneyland Railroad though, grab your churros, grab your mint juleps, grab your popcorn, you can enjoy all of that on board. Just keep a hold of your trash because this is the granddaddy of all Disney railroads. The Disneyland Railroad is the best. Does the Walt Disney World Railroad let you travel back in time to the era of the dinosaurs? No. Does the Disneyland Paris Railroad let you view a diorama of the Grand Canyon? Absolutely not. Disneyland wins. That's enough yapping from me though. The number one entry on this list is visible as you pull into the New Orleans Square train station. Not much is actually visible these days when you pull into the New Orleans Square train station, but it's actually right before you get there. As you transition from the wilds of Adventureland into the square of New Orleans, the train will pass by a sort of fake staging area for Mardi Gras float decorations, including flowers and different props. You can see fireworks, giant royalty heads, giant beads, and most importantly here, of course, as I mentioned before, the flowers. Now, these flowers aren't just regular set dressing for the Disneyland Railroad. They actually come from a previously existing attraction, not ride, attraction. The attraction was actually a parade across the Esplanade at Disney's California Adventure, a parade that premiered alongside the rest of the park when it opened in 2001, you know, early DCA when it was early DCA. The parade, however, I gotta admit, was quite impressive, and it was called Eureka. And it showcased and celebrated different cultures from all around California, thus fitting into the theme of the park theme park. Oh, that's why they call it that. There were a ton of different floats, like water sports, like surfing and I guess riding a jet ski. That's a pretty cool float topper. A Japanese Chinatown and San Francisco themed float where two giant pieces of the Golden Gate Bridge would come together to form the complete bridge. Actually, kind of neat. But what we're looking for here is the Hispanic California section of the parade, where you would have dancers both in dresses and dressed up as tropical birds, and behind them a huge float featuring a live drummer and, hmm, do my eyes deceive me? Flowers along the base. You can see that the flowers on the float are a bit more vibrant than the ones you would find at the New Orleans Square train station, but rest assured, they are the same. Like this one here with the pink petals. You can find it right here at the New Orleans Square train station. The middle has been repainted, but those petals are unmistakably the same. Or this purple uh, flower here. I'm sorry, I don't have my flower names memorized. Its design has been a bit simplified, but rest assured that is the very same flower from Eureka. Now let this serve as a lesson. When one of your friends says that Disney California Adventure 1.0 is completely dead, you can say to your friend, no, friend, and it is in fact woven into the entire fabric of the Disneyland Resort itself. Walt's favorite attraction from 1955 is now intertwined with my favorite parade from 2001. That's me speaking as you. It's not my favorite parade. That's Paint the Night, obviously. But yours is probably Eureka. So the next time you're on the Disneyland Railroad passing into New Orleans Square, you scream at the top of your lungs to the conductor, STOP! STOP THE TRAIN! STOP THE TRAIN FOR THE LOVE OF GOD! STOP THE TRAIN! Actually, don't do that, probably. That'd cause a panic. Just take a look at the set that lies in front of you. 
Because there's some history there. History that doesn't necessarily date all the way back to 1955, but all the way back to 2001, 23 years ago. That's kind of crazy. Forever tying together Walt Disney's dream of a theme park where parents and children can have fun together, and a parade that celebrates the cultures of California. One of those is far cooler than the other one, and I'm just gonna leave you to decide which one is which. So whether you're at Walt Disney World, specifically Animal Kingdom I guess in the case of this video, or over at Disneyland, there are little pieces of history no matter where you look, hidden in the most unlikely of places. And it's important to keep your eyes peeled because you never know just what monkey! Sorry, that's a, that's a cool monkey in the tree there. <clears throat> just what little bits of history you can find. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm off to make my next video about how the Disneyland Railroad is far and away the most superior of any and all railroads in any of the Disney parks anywhere. Because, come on, why, why can't I bring my mint julep on the Walt Disney World Railroad? It's not because, obviously, they don't serve mint juleps at Walt Disney World, I know that, but I just want to be able to take a sip while I'm riding the train through Tomorrowland. Hello there everyone, I hope you enjoyed this video about me ranting as to why not? Why can't I bring food on the Walt Disney World Railroad? It's the most its the most effective way to relax in the middle of the day at Disneyland. Why can't I do it at Disney World? Oh, and also the, the five remnants and, and references too. That's important to this video also, I, I guess. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit that like button. And if you're new around here, please be sure to hit that subscribe button just so you keep up to date with my newest and uh, greatest uploads. Yeah, greatest. That's the word I'm looking for. The names that you see scrolling by on the side of your screen right now are the names of all of my supporters over at patreon.com slash offhand Disney. They get early access to videos like this one, and they also get their names in the credits at the end of the month, like you're seeing now. If you are interested in joining those ranks and getting access to early videos, credits, and and also exclusive Patreon videos. Those are videos that only my supporters get to see. I believe there are two of them now. Head over to the link in the description down below. However, if you'd rather just follow me for free, you can head over to Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. I am at Offhand Disney on all of those platforms. Makes it a, a bit easier to find me. But everybody, that, I believe, wraps up this episode. Thank you all so much for watching. Just a nice little throwback video this week. No face cam, just me and you talking about old Disney history. It's a good time. Uh, we'll see you in the next one, I guess. We'll see you next week, folks. That's a wrap. <laughs> All right. Goodbye.